optimal power flow is the topic of this week. So what is optimal power flow? We'll do it in two parts, uh, today and next week. The optimal power flow is the prototypical, prototypical optimization problem that is found in electrical grids. So it's a very, very generic problem that always has this form. We want to minimize the cost of operation of a grid, of an electrical grid, subject to constraints that are constraints, of course, on the control variables and on the operation of the grid. What are the control variables? The control variables are very classically the set point of generators. Other resources like capacitor banks, batteries, we'll see that in the lab where we will use batteries to control the voltage on a distribution network. Other resources like tap changers, uh, load management actions like shedding loads, doing demand response, for example, or also connecting or disconnecting switches to change the configuration of the grid. The cost is classically the cost of generation. This is the classical form, but often it is also other costs that reflect the objective that we have. For example, if we are controlling voltage, the cost might reflect how close the voltage is to the standard value it should have. Constraints, we'll see them in detail. There, of course, if we're controlling the cost of a diesel generator, well, it's the power that this diesel generator is able to produce. Uh, constraints are also typically the constraints imposed by the grid in the form of the current and voltage, very classically. Sometimes those can be approximated by, uh, current limits can be approximated by apparent power. We will see examples of this. It is used, as I mentioned, very in many, many aspects of the control of a grid. In the planning, planning is, for example, when we decide as a grid operator, Swiss grid, for example, whether a uh, reserve uh, should be mobilized on a given day of the week. So this is day ahead planning, which generator should we plan to operate? It can be also in quasi real time. Quasi real time means, for example, every 15 minutes when you may decide to start or stop a generator in order to have power balance and also have quality of service in the grid. We will see ample problems of this in these two weeks. Here is an example. That's a toy grid with three buses, one, two, three, and three generators and three loads. So on every bus, there is a load that has a demand of 100 megawatts on the two top buses and 500 megawatts on the bottom buses, on the bottom bus. Bus one is the slack bus, so it's connected to a generator that provides constant voltage. And at the other buses, there are generators uh, that are supplying uh, power under the control of the voltage imposed by uh, bus number one. In such a closed and simple grid, what we may want to do is, for example, minimize the total cost of generations, which would be given by this objective functions, subject to all the information I gave before. For example, the voltages magnitude should be not deviating more than 5% of their nominal values. Here I use per unit calculus, so volt nominal vo voltage is one. Intensities should be also less than absolute values of the current on all lines should not exceed a value that is given by the thermal limit of the line. Voltage is important because many devices will not operate properly if voltage is outside the bounds. Intensity is important because a too large intensity will cause uh, heating of the lines and sustained heating will cause damages, for example, to insulators. Sometimes, as I mentioned, uh, intensities can be replaced by branch flow limits. Sometimes also for generators, you may have a, a apparent power limit. And you also have typically uh, constraints on the generators, for example, uh, the capacity of the generator, but also the rate at which you can change the set point of the generator. So in this generic form, this is what we have here. In this specific example, I took only those constraints shown here. 
I assume that the generator capacities uh, are given here. The generators can provide between zero and 400 megawatts of active current and between minus 80 and plus 80 of reactive uh, power, of active power and reactive power. And here are the costs. So we see that G2 is a very cheap generator, costs very little. Uh, G1 is not very expensive and G3 is very expensive. So of course we would like to start G2 as much as possible, use G1 second and G3 as little as possible. But the large load is close to G3, which is a very typical case. You very often have large bulk generators that are not immediately connected to where the large demand is because the large bulk generators are for example thermal plants or nuclear plants that are usually kept in industrial areas far away from uh, cities or not too close to the city centers which is most of the load is so this is a simple but not so atypical example here here, we assume that the load is given. The load is given, of course, the load is random, but in large grids, it is possible to forecast the load with a fairly good accuracy. So here we will assume that the load, at least in this first minute, we will see a bit later what happens when it becomes random. We assume that it's fixed, and then the goal is to find the optimal values of those three generators that will minimize the cost of generation. We can go one step further, and if we write the equation exactly, then we have to introduce all the variables that correspond to the electrical grid state. So the grid state is given here by V variables, which are the complex voltages. The current, which are deduced from the voltages by this equation here, as you have seen in the previous weeks the generation active and reactive power the apparent power which is uh, the complex power g plus j q and the constraints are the constraints given by the power flow equations the equations we use when we do state estimation for example here this is the equation for the total injected complex power at every bus, which is the complex power injected by the generators, minus the complex power, the one that is consumed by the loads. Here, to simplify, I'm assuming that the loads have a constant cos phi, a constant angle, which means that the value, when we speak of a load as active power, there is reactive power, but the angle is constant here. This is also a simplification. Typically, it varies, but not so much. And here I have an equation that says V1 is one. So one, that's the complex number one. It means that the complex voltage is dictated by bus one, which is the slack bus. So it means the magnitude is one. That's the job of the slack bus to maintain the voltage constant in magnitude. And also the phase is equal to one. That is more of a convention. It means this is the reference point for the phases in the network. So this is the mathematical problem we have. I coded this in MATLAB and I asked a generic optimis optimizer, FMINCON in this instance, to solve it. And this is what I obtained. So the first take home message is after all, the power flow problem, the optimal power flow problem, is simply an optimization problem. And then we can solve it uh, by brute force using a generic optimizer. We will discuss that a bit later. It turns out that this is very limited, but it is still something that we should not forget. We can always do it. And in small cases, it will give good results. In large cases, it may need more attention and we will see other methods for that. Here is the result of this optimization. The result shows the state at every node in red. We see here that the first uh, generator, G1, is generating 400 active power plus 80 reactive power. So it's at the max of its capacity. The second generator is not at the max. It's generating a lot, but not the max that it could. And the last generator is generating also a relatively small fraction of its active power, but a large fraction of its reactive power. Note that in this optimization problem, the reactive power has no cost. It doesn't appear in the cost function which is, 
as a first approximation is correct. So we might say if reactive power does not play a role, why is there a value computed by the optimizer? Or is the value completely uh, unimportant? Uh, probably not, because we see that we have the max value. Reactive power is used to reduce the losses. We know that the thermal losses on the lines is proportional to the current square, and the current depends on active and reactive power. So if the reactive power is bad, the apparent power will be large and there will be more losses, which can be compensated by uh, injecting the appropriate level of uh, power into the line. Lines consume reactive power, so this is why we need to inject some of it. We see also the state of the grid at the optimal power, power uh, at the optimal point of operation. We see here the magnitude of voltage, 0 0.98, so the voltage at point 2 is a little less than at point 1. Point 1 is the slack bus, the voltage is 1. And the voltage at point 3 is the less which is typical. We see that voltage decreases because the power flow is probably generating from point one. I see a question on the chat here. Why isn't G2 producing at its max since it has the cheap, cheapest production cost? So here, the question is, why don't we have G2 here produce the max that it can? Well, the answer is here. There are, of course, constraints on how much this grid is able to transport. And the resulting power flows are shown in blue here. Be careful of what the notation here. A blue arrow here means I'm computing the power flow at the head of the arrow, at the beginning of the arrow. And it's given here. So here there is 64 megawatts of active power that is flowing from 1 to 2 and one night close to 200 that is flowing from 2 to 3, and 235 that's flowing from 1 to 3. There is a limitation on the grid here given by this constraint. The line 1, 3 has uh, a capacity of 300 apparent megawatt of apparent power, or mega uh, MVA. Line 1, 2 and 2, 3 have a maximum apparent power of 200. So this is a, the limiting capacity here. Here we would like optimally to generate as much of G2 as we can, but we cannot send all this power to G3 because in order to send it, most of it would flow on this line. And in fact, we see that this line is at its capacity. So the capacities that are reached in this constraint optimization problem are the capacity of this line and the capacity of this uh, generator here. We see also marginal prices that are given here. We will talk about it a bit later. The marginal price is the pr additional price that we will have to pay if we add one megawatt of, or one small unit of demand at a given node. If here at this node, instead of 100, I add one megawatt, so I consume one as uh, 101 megawatts, then I will have to pay one franc per megawatt and per hour. If the same occurs at node one, I will have to pay this amount. And if this occurs at this amount node, I will have to pay that amount. We see that the prices, the marginal prices are very different. It's very small at node two because node two has a very cheap production cost and cannot use all of its production capacity because the line is limiting. So if there is more demand here, it will be satisfied by local production. It will cost one franc per uh, unit here. If there's more demand at node three, it will have to come from node one and there will be more losses on the line. And this is the resulting cost that we'll have. We'll have the cost of generation plus the cost of the losses here. More interestingly, if there's more demand at node one, there is a cost that is much larger than the cost of local production. This is because node one is, was saturating and was feeding the, the generation here. So if we increase the demand here, we will need to produce more generation that will come from a mix of G3 and G1. Here I did the same 
exactly the same exercise, but assuming the capacities of the lines are different, they are multiplied by 10. They are given by these values here. Then we see exactly what we were expecting uh, a few minutes ago. In this case, the grid is very powerful, so we will produce all electricity from G2, from the cheapest generator. We will see that it will be at its maximum capacity. And we will see also that the marginal costs will be different. They will be smaller almost everywhere, not at G2, and they will be very close to the same price everywhere, which is 15 francs per megawatt hour, which is the cost of generation at node one, which means that this grid is using fully the capacity of this generator and any additional capacity has come from has to come from G1 and G1 costs 15 francs per megawatt hour. And it's a bit more here because of the losses and it's a bit less here because of the losses that you save by consuming more locally. We see that the power flows here are still given by those values, but they have changed. Now there is a minus sign here, which means that active power now is flowing from G2 to G1, and also from G1 to G3, and from G2 to G3. So this is what the optimal power flow is showing. Uh, yes, I wanted to show here also, we see that in this case, the voltage is higher at G2. So we see that the max power is in fact coming from G2. So in some sense, the source of this network has now become G2, the highest point in this network. Highest, if I take the analogy of voltage being equivalent to a fluid network or a network of water pipes, where uh, you can think of the lines as pipes that has a given orientation, uh, a given altitude at every end and the altitude is the voltage magnitude at least as a first approximation we could uh, view it like this we'll see also how to view it in a different sense when we can do the dc approximation in a few more minutes voila so this is what the optimal power flow says to us about uh, this grid it says also things like the total losses here we see that there are small but not economically negligible losses. From an engineering viewpoint, we have 20 out of a total of 700. So it's small, it's a few percent, but it's not negligible. If you pay uh, many francs per kilowatt hour, that's some amount of money. And we see also the total cost, which is a total cost of generation here. And the losses are equal to, uh, sorry, the sum of generation of active power generation plus the losses, uh, minus the losses, is equal to 700, the sum of the consumption here. So we have seen a one-time one time, uh, optimal power flow. Very often what is done is called a dispatch plan, where we do this not once uh, per day, but for example, once every 15 minutes for the following day, this is called a dispatch plan. The only difference is that we need to add uh, one index for time. Here, for example, it's one per hour uh, day ahead. And then there is to add, so all the state variables have now a dependency on time, which intellectually doesn't change anything except perhaps typically ramping constraints. In the generation limits, we have the capacities of the generators but we have also uh, how fast they can change. So some generators cannot change infinitely fast, some can. For example, if you have a solar panel and you decide to curtail it, to stop its production, you can instantly go to max production to zero. So there is no down ramping constraint, but if you have a diesel generator or a battery, that is, if a battery is generating power and you ask it to absorb power, it cannot do it instantly. It will take several seconds to do it. So if we do a real-time control, it will have ramping constraints for the batteries. If we do a control on a larger time scale, we will have also ramping constraints for the big thermal generators. For example, the gas powered uh, machines or the diesel engines will have limits on the derivative which in discrete time gives uh, this kind of equation. 
Apart from adding constraints, what it really adds is more variables. And we will see that, in fact, one of the problems of the optimization that we have in the power flow is that we have a lot of variables, so standard optimization procedures come to their limits. Okay, one little break. Here is a question I'm asking you. Uh, for this grid that we have seen here, I'm making two statements, A and B. Take a few minutes to analyze it and use speak up to say which one you think is true. Well, are we ready to see the answers? Majority of you, I'm closing the poll, sorry. Ping. You should see on your speak up screen the answer. If you don't see it, here it is. Majority says B, and B is the correct answer. Why is it the correct answer? Because there has to be a balance of powers. Exactly. The balance of, whoops. The balance of power on the lines, you have to be careful that the power injected by node one in line one three, so here, the one that's shown on the figure, is not the same as the one that is injected by node three or minus the power that's injected by node three, which is the power received by node three from this line at the other end. If I compute it, of course you could not have it, but you can do it later in MATLAB, you will find this value here. You will find another value. And if I do the sum of the two, the difference is the power that has disappeared on the line. So it is the loss. The loss on this type of network, so this grid is a transmission grid, it's a high voltage grid. And in high voltage grid, the losses, the active power losses are small compared to the reactive power losses. This is why we have high voltage lines. It is to avoid uh, losing uh, active power too much. But the take home message is be careful. In grids, of course, the power injections at one end of the line is not the same as at the other end. And B is correct. B says that the sum of the powers must be zero. This is true at a bus. A bus is a zero space connection. It's a connection at which there is no loss inside the bus by definition of a bus. If a bus is very large, and there is loss in the bus bar that interconnects two points, then we will model it as two buses with a line, for example. Voila. Any questions on, on this part? If not, you can ask your questions uh, later. 
So if, if we wanted to stop there, essentially we could say, well, the OPF is not a very interesting problem. Uh, after all, that's all we've, it's an immediate application of all the modeling you have learned to do in the previous uh, modules in particular of the power flow uh, equations. However, given the importance of the problem, uh, the OPF has received a lot of attention in particular because, as we will see, it's a nasty problem from the optimization viewpoint. It's a non-convex problem and it's a problem for which we cannot simply use very efficient methods uh, out of the box. So we can ask MATLAB like I did to solve it using fmincom, but if you're running Swiss grid or uh, part of the French grid, uh, you will not do that. You will use special solvers and those special solvers will take a lot of time to converge, will require a lot of tuning. So those are uh, generic, um, not generic, those are uh, numerical non-convex optimization solvers using a gradient descent typically. But there are many cases where we cannot afford this. In particular, if we're doing online control or also if we want to understand what happens. So we will see that there are simplifications of the problem that are not exact but uh, that provide more flexible techniques. One of them is the DC approximation, another one is linearization. So we'll see those two problems. And then in a second phase we will also need to address uncertainty. Here I gave a two simple example where I said here is the grid, here is the load. But of course when you're managing a grid you cannot pretend that everything will be exactly as you plan it to be. What if the load would be 20% larger? Would you be able to support the grid constraints? What kind of generator should, which generator should increase its value? Those are the questions that we will address next week in the part on the control and uh, management of uncertainty. Right now, what we will do is uh, give a bit of background information on the tools from optimization theory that we will use in this context. And I will speak in particular of convex optimization here. Convex optimization is in practice the only optimization problems that we can solve well. Not all convex problems are easy to solve, but uh, problems that are easy to solve are all convex. So when we have large scale problem and we invariably have large scale problem with um, OPF because we have many variables, we have the state variables, we have a multiplication of the state variables per time slot. So we will need simplifications of the problem. And one of them is to make the problem convex here. So what is a convex problem? A convex problem is a problem that can be cast typically in this form, minimizing a convex function over a convex set or maximizing a concave function over a convex set. What is a convex set? Well, this is illustrated here. It's a set such that if two points are in it, the segment that joins them is in it. This is convex, this is not convex. And what is a convex function? A convex function is one that is below its chords, so any average of the value of two points is less than the value, the, uh, is larger than the value that we would have by applying the function. And a concave function is with the converse inequality and a function that is neither convex nor concave uh, is that kind, for example. How do we know if something is convex? Well, this is the definition. We sometimes use the definition something that is often used in practice is if a function is convex then it is above the linear approximation that we do by doing the order one Taylor expansion which is given here or geometrically it means if the uh, function is above the tangents. Uh, a very convenient test is whether the second derivative the matrix of all second derivative is positive semi-definite. So you take the, uh, if f is on n variables, this will be an n by an n matrix here. Then we have manipulations of convex functions. If I sum uh, positive uh, weights as, uh, of, if I sum functions with positive weights, uh, and each function is convex, the sum is convex. The max of convex function is convex. 
This is something we will uh, often use. The composition of two convex functions is in general not convex, except if the uh, last function is increasing here. So those are things uh, that you probably know. If you didn't know, then it's time to learn it. Why are convex problems so special? Well, this is illustrated. Of course, this is a simplifying result. It's showing in dimension one, which is not uh, explaining all the complexity, but may give a, a hint. If I want to minimize a convex function over a convex set, for example, over an interval in the X space, there will be uh, one minimum and any local minimum is the global minimum. There cannot be a local minimum that is not the global minimum. So this is why convex solvers exist because all they need is to go in the direction of the gradient. And of course they do smarter things. And here's an example where a function is non-convex and uh, as you can see, uh, you can be trapped in a local minimum that may be good or very far from the optimal point of operation. We will not in this course do a theory of convex optimization. There is a course on this. We, if you had a course, then you'll be happy to employ all the knowledge you've learned. If you did not have a course, we'll give you all the knowledge that is required. But the most important thing we will need in this course is to be able to formulate problems. Whether a problem is convex is something we should be able to, um, to detect and to recognize. But as we will see, we will have to work a lot on the problem transformation. That is one of the topics we will see. So to exercise this, here is a first quiz. Here I'm proposing three problems. Which of those are convex? I close the poll and the majority says F, which is the correct answer. The first problem, A is not convex. This is a convex function, but the convex problem is about minimizing a convex function. Maximizing a convex function is not a convex problem. In fact, if you maximize x square over an interval, the max uh, will typically be uh, at the edge, either in A or in B, right? which is uh, a different behavior than this one, which is a minimum, where the minimum here will be, well, depending on A and B. How do you solve such a problem? Well, we typically know how to solve what is the minimum of a quadratic problem if there's no constraint, so we'll look for the minimum. If the minimum is in the interval, that's the solution else the solution should be also at one of the edges. So B is convex because this is a minimization of a convex function over a convex set. The convex sets in one dimension are simply the intervals. Closed, open, bounded or unbounded, all intervals are convex. C is also convex because the objective function is linear. Linear is convex and concave, so it is here a concave function that we maximize, so it fits in the framework. And the set of constraints is given by linear inequalities, so any single inequality gives a half plane, which is a convex set. And if we take the intersection of convex sets, we obtain a convex set. So this is a convex set. So this is a prototype of a large family of convenient convex problems, which are called linear programs that we will abundantly use.
Here is a, another problem, perhaps a bit more complicated than it looks. Is this problem formulated as a convex problem? I close the poll. And the majority says C, which is the correct answer. It depends on the value of A and B. So the convex, the, the set of constraints is convex. This is the interior of a disk. This is a disk the interior and the boundary of a circle. So this is a convex set. This objective function, well, if A and B are positive, then it is a convex function. So this is a convex problem. But if B is negative and A is positive, this will not be a convex function, and this will not be a convex problem. We can see that by taking the matrix of the second derivative, and we'll find a matrix that contains A and B, and if the, by applying this, uh, first criterion, we will have uh, this result. So take home message is, well, quadratic problems are typically convex, but when they are positive, when the coefficients are positive typically, or more generally, if the quadratic form is semi-definite positive. We will very often use in the context of OPF, linear programs, which uh, we've seen an example before. So this is the prototype of a linear program. We minimize a function of x, which has n dimensions, subject to constraints that can be expressed by inequalities or equalities. And the objective function is itself linear. Yeah. So this is the prototype because this, uh, there, it can be solved with huge number of variables, hundreds of thousands of variables on standard computers and much more on dedicated computers. The mean or the max gives, uh, give the same, so because the linear function is both concave and convex, and con yes, concave and convex, so if I take the max problem, I will have also a linear, pro a linear program. We can also see that if I change c in minus c, computing the minimum of minus cx is the result of this is minus the maximum of this. So we can go from one to the other simply by changing C into minus C. That's a trick that we will often have to use when we manipulate linear programs. Here's an example of a linear program. That's uh, the one we had seen before. Uh, here is the set of constraints uh, in gray. The objective function is uh, given by a linear function and it is optimum at this point here. So for linear programs, that's very classical, the optimum will always be obtained at one of the edges of the polytope, one of the summits of the polytope, and there are very efficient ways to navigate through the set of feasible points until we reach one of, the, one of these points here. Formulating problem as a linear program is one of the things we will need to do in this uh, context here. And sometimes something may be expressed as a linear program, but is not expressible, but sometimes it is expressible. Let's see, for example, those two optimization problems, A and B. Obviously, the first one is not formulated as a linear program because it has a square. And same for the second. The second is a max function. 
So, but is there a way to transform the problem such that it becomes a linear program? That's the question. I close the poll. Well, admittedly, that's a bit of a tricky question. The correct answer is B, as the majority is saying. Why is that? Well, first, let's observe that A is a quadratic problem. Is it possible to transform a quadratic problem over a generic set like this one? So this set is very much like this. So it's uh, the interior of a polygon in two dimensions. So the interior doesn't look like we can transform it. Now, can we transform a quadratic problem into a linear one? Well, I cannot make the proof in a few minutes, but what I can say is that if this would be possible, then this, <coughs> excuse me, this would be known. If there would be a known way to transform quadratic into linear, then we would not have quadratic solvers. That's the short answer. The long answer would be a bit uh, more sophisticated, but that's the short answer. B is more interesting. B is saying, I want to minimize this, which is a max of two linear functions. So this is not formulated as a linear program. But can I formulate it as a linear program? The answer is yes. And there is a trick that is simply here shown that I add an optimization variable, t, and I minimize t, the optimization variable, over the, the constraints that we had before, plus I add the constraint that t is larger than those two quantities. Why do I do this? Well, because if you think about it, what is the optimal solution of that? Since T is a variable that has been added and is not involved with any of the previous constraints, the optimal solution is obtained when T is the smallest value that is larger than all of this here. So what is the smallest value that is larger than all of this? Well, it is the max of those two constraints. So here I'm using this statement that says, saying that the variable t is larger than the first and the second quantity is the same that it is larger than the max of those two quantities here. Therefore, what am I doing in this augmented optimization problem? I'm asking what is the minimum of the value of t over the set that is shown here in pink. This is the set of all value of t that is larger than my, my value f0. And what is the answer of that? So x and y are on the x-axis here in this domain. If I minimize t subject to the constraint that t is larger than f0 of x, y, then the answer is, well, it is the minimum of f0 of x and y, which is uh, almost obvious, but is a very important trick. What is the take home message of this? Well, we will very often have problems that are not strictly linear, but that can very easily be transformed into linear problems. Those are the problems when we have objective functions that are given by max of linear functions. More generally, more generally 
if I have a problem where the objective is separable into a sum of functions, and the first n functions are made of max here. So for function j is the max of a number of g functions that are given here. Then solving such a problem is equivalent to this here, where I add one variable per function, that is a max, t1, t2, tn. So I add the variable t, and I add the, I keep the, all the constraints I had on x, of course, and I add the constraint that t, every variable t, is larger than all the g's, which is what we did a minute ago. This has a name, it's called a max removal transformation, because we had the problem where in the objective function there was a max term, which is transformed, transformed into another problem. It's not the same, solving this might require different techniques than solving that, but here we have removed the max. So in particular, if the g functions are all linear, then we have transformed uh, something that was nonlinear into something that is linear. So this is something that we will very often use, as you will see in the rest of the course.